Did Zizek do something recently? Um, I mean, he – the most recent thing I saw people were mad about was he basically said any leftist worth their salt will support Ukraine full stop, which, of course, we all know amounts to saying you have to support the U.S. proxy war against Russia that's using the Ukrainian people as cannon fodder, um, which the U.S. claims is supporting Ukraine. Uh, but Gabriel Rockhill then, <clears throat> who's a philosopher um, and has studied Zizek and, and a lot of Zizek's contemporaries and influences, um, wrote an article basically saying that Zizek is the, um, like the jester, the joker um, of capitalist society, someone who pretends to be a Marxist radical while diluting all of their Marxist analysis with anti-Marxist analysis and saying that existing socialism has failed every time and lending his support to imperialist projects like the destruction of Yugoslavia in the 90s um, or now the U.S. proxy war against Russia. Um, so Rock Hill published that article and obviously got a lot of traction, a lot of, um, a lot of, I want to say criticism, but not even criticism. A lot of people just attacked Rock Hill um, attacked his personality and made ad hominem attacks against him. But, um, but that's what happened recently. So I was watching your Rock Hill video and two tabs over was a video of someone dying on the hill of Zizek weird stuff. Huh. I mean, some people have a huge attachment. Hasn't Sanders sold out for years, kind of. Um, some people have a huge attachment to Zizek and I've never understood it. Right, because my entry into Marxism was through geopolitics, right? It was through learning about imperialism, what the U.S. capitalist ruling class, the financial oligarchy, has done around the world, you know, how the global system has been set up basically to exploit um, the global South and the East at the the behest of Western finance capitalists in Wall Street and London. And then I found Marxism from there because, you know, Marxism explained far better than any other method um, how or any other philosophy why these things happen. Um, so when you hear Zizek talk about geopolitics, you know, he says stuff like socialism has always failed or he says stuff like I mean, that's not geopolitics. That's history. But um, he says stuff like you got to support Ukraine full stop. Um, he supported the dismantling of Yugoslavia. And I'm like, these things were horrible. Right. So. He was consistently wrong on the geopolitical issues, on the issue of imperialism, which is the main contradiction of, of capitalism today, outside of the contradiction between labor and capital. Um, so I was never that interested in what he had to say. I was never that interested in his philosophy. I'm like, well, he's wrong. So clearly his philosophy, you know, it, it didn't interest me. It wasn't like, ah, I got to read more of this. Um, unlike Marx or Lenin, where you read their analyses from years ago and you're like, oh, so many of these predictions have come true and whatnot. Um, this explains so much. Zizek didn't explain anything for me, so I never got into him. But a lot of people have an attachment to him because he does these like pop culture analyses. He talks about TV shows and movies and stuff, and it you know, purports to be Marxist analysis. Um, so a lot of people like that that kind of content and have an attachment to him, um, and have a hard time accepting like a real deep, um, real deep or real cutting critique of Zizek's positions overall and his position in what Gabriel Rockhill refers to as the global theory industry. So, you know, there's theory produced all around the world um, and, you know, different theories serve different classes of people within the economic system. Um, and Zizek's anti-Marxist theory that purports to be Marxist, Rockhill is arguing, serves the... Um, the capitalist imperialist class over the workers, which in my opinion, as someone who, like I said, has disagreed with pretty much all of Zizek's um, geopolitical opinions since day one. Um, I, I think Rock Hill's critique was very accurate, very accurate. So speaking of that, since we're talking about this, um, I think that's a good transition into the Zizek video I have for today. I want to keep him sped up at 1.25, but just let me know if that's too fast to understand it. Because I know Zizek sniffs a lot um, and has an accent. Um, if you're from good old America, America, like me. Um, so if you have trouble understanding him, let me know. First, let me clarify my point. I repeat this again and again, three theses. The first one, the main responsibility for the refugee crisis lies with 
us, the West, the Western powers. At two levels, we have this responsibility. First, the economic one. Again, I always mention this country, which is the ultimate horror for me today, Congo, Republic of Congo. It's a country very wealthy, called on other minerals, and it's presented as kind of a heart of darkness. Yeah, but this heart of darkness is fully included into global economy. In the, you know, all those local war, warlords there are selling the stuff to, comp, uh, to mineral companies, whatever. What I want to say is this, that uh, this decay, ruin, failed states in Africa, this is not just some primitivism there. It's clearly, it's elementary, to quote several columns. It's uh, linked uh, to the way global capitalism relates to, exploits, whatever you say, those countries. For example, I can tell you that, imagine that all the minerals disappear from the ground of Congo. I claim it would have been, and this is the tragedy for them, a much more peaceful, better state. And it's the same in many other countries when we hear about religious conflicts and so on, usually there are. This actually goes along pretty well with the idea I was saying earlier in the Grundrisse that um, the mode of production determines the mode of pillage. So he's saying that, you know, the Congo was pillaged as they had so many um, resources because they had so many minerals under their soil. It made them a target um, and things would have ultimately been easier um, if they didn't which I think ultimately things would have been easier if we had a socialist revolution in the West and we overthrew our imperialist finance capitalist governments. Um, but I digress. We will continue. Our Western interests behind and so on and so on. So first we should talk openly, frankly, about what, for the lack of better term, we can call economic neocolonialism. And nobody is clean here. We shouldn't blame only the West. For example, I celebrate China. It's incredible what economic success they are. But the way they are act, acting recently in some African countries, Latino American countries, and others, it's clear, absolute economic neocolonialism also. So they are also doing it. Or another. Okay. So he's saying that, you know, people are placing too much blame on the capitalist West. You know, people are placing too much blame for imperialism and neocolonialism on the capitalist West. Why don't we look at China? Right? Why don't we look at what China's doing? Right? We have to acknowledge that neocolonialism and imperialism plays at least some role in the politics of the global south in the in the yeah, poverty that exists in some countries versus western countries. You know, imperialism might play some kind of role. Um Zizek probably hasn't even read Lenin's imperialism, so um he doesn't understand the extent um or he just dismissed it as, as simplistic. Um, but we can acknowledge it as some role, but why are we looking so much at the West, right? Why are we looking so much at London and Wall Street, where all of the world's biggest finance capitalists and owners of multinational corporations are located, who are lobbying politicians and paying the campaign or paying for the campaigns of politicians? to ensure that they have control of the government and the military and can use it for warfare against enemy states, to clear the room for multinational corporations, to pillage these countries of their resources. Right? We can acknowledge that that's happening. But what about China, though? What about China? What about the socialist countries doing developmental programs with these, with these countries who have been exploited by the U.S.? You know, the IMF and the World Bank, these arms of Western finance capital, they're doing these structural adjustment loans, giving other countries loans that actually are intended to trap them in debt, leave them subservient to the U.S. and force them to make their economies neoliberal, meaning getting rid of um, labor unions, regulations on corporations, um, minimum wage, implementing what's called austerity. That's what the IMF and World Bank have been doing. China's giving them loans, too. You know, so it's got to be the same thing. So let, let's start placing more blame on China and quit criticizing the West so much is basically what he's saying, which is absurd. Um, and I'll explain why it's absurd. But first, let's see, you know, what argument Zizek gives, what data, what kind of sources, what explanation is he going to give um, to prove that China is acting in a neocolonial way? Because he said it's obvious, right? He said it's clear, cut and dry neocolonialism. Um, so let, let's see the evidence that he gives for that. 
colonialism also. So they are also doing it. Or another horrible thing for me, you know what some Asian countries and Arab countries here, exceptionally, we are not so guilty. Like I think South, another horrible thing for me, you know what some Asian countries and Arab countries here, exceptionally, we are not so guilty. Like I think South Korea is doing it, uh, Saudi Arabia and so on. They are buying large tracts of the best fertile land in some African countries from Mozambique to Madagascar, even in Somalia, sorry, not Somalia, but Eritrea and so on. And they use it mostly even for industrial plants to export and so on. I mean, this is, so this is one, the economic aspect. Oh, they're industrializing? They're using the land for industrial purposes? which as Lenin explains in uh, his, his groundbreaking text, imperialism is the opposite of what U S imperialism does. U S imperialism holds countries, arrests their development, prevents them from industrializing, leaves them in a state of poverty and only develops the industries that are useful to the colonial exploiters. So that's the exact same thing as China industrializing these areas. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense at all. And if you look at the loans that China is giving these countries, they're very similar to the Marshall Plan, which the U.S. did with West Europe after World War II, where they gave them a bunch of loans for industrial projects, developing their productive and industrial base, the core of their economy, so that they could serve as trading partners and allies with the U.S., um, and develop faster economically than the socialist countries. That's what the U.S. was doing. And I know Zizek wouldn't call the Marshall Plan neocolonialism. Of course not. Nobody would. It wasn't neocolonialism. Those, those loans had 4% interest rates. They were designed to, to lift the European countries out of poverty so the U.S. would have allies, or not out of poverty, but build them up um, economically so the U.S. could have allies. But then when China does the very same thing, 4% uh, interest rates on these loans aimed at industrialization, not aimed at exploitation, like the structural adjustment loans from the IMF and World Bank. That's absolutely neocolonialism, cut and dry. I mean, this is ridiculous. And this is where you get into the problem with Zizek, right? This is the problem with Zizek. He says these things as if they're just absolutely true, right? And, um, as if uh, they can't be refuted and as if they're proven by material evidence, but then there's no effort to actually do the intellectual work and do the research that's needed to check if his assumptions are correct or not, right? He doesn't actually know how the Chinese loans are structured. He doesn't know how these loans have been designed specifically to counteract um, finance imperialism uh, like the structural adjustment loans of the IMF and World Bank that comes from Western finance capitalists, right? He he acknowledges that China is helping these countries industrialize, but he just says, ah, China is buying up huge swaths of land and industrializing them. Not really, right? There um, are, are projects that are overseen um, by Chinese firms or, or by um, the Chinese government to various extents in the global South. But for the most part, you know, the Global South agrees to the Belt and Road Initiative. They have to enter into the Belt and Road Initiative because they prefer industrializing their country for and, and not racking up an insane amount of debt and becoming subservient to the West rather than taking loans from the IMF and World Bank that they know in the Global South at this point are going to trap them in debt and are going to lead to the U.S. completely controlling their politics and um, every aspect of their society. Um. So, I mean, that's why a lot of Arab countries and a lot of countries in the global south are going along with the Belt and Road, which Zizek is lamenting right now. Oh, no, they're just falling into neocolonialism 2.0. But he, he hardly knows anything about the loans themselves, right? He hardly knows anything about China's Belt and Road Initiative himself. He just said they're buying up swaths of land and industrializing them, which is, you know, an oversimplification of the Belt and Road Initiative or a severe oversimplification Um and basically a false view um, of the, the Belt and Road Initiative. So he comes up with these theories, these concepts in his head, but there's no effort to actually um, compare them to reality. How well do my theories compare to reality? 
right? How does re does reality confirm my theories or does it refute them? And then, you know, do I have to change my theories so that they're more fitting to reality? That's Marxism, right? That's Marxism, which is a science, a study of society that's constantly developing and changing as society develops and changes. You know, Zizek is not doing a Marxist analysis. Um, and in his conclusions, in his analysis of reality, he always finds himself on the same side as the imperialists, as the Western capitalist imperialists, right? In this lecture, he's doing about neocolonialism and imperialism, which has absolutely been perpetrated by finance capitalists in the West. He immediately shifts the focus to China, a country which has abolished relative poverty, is helping to industrialize and develop many countries who have been targeted by imperialism for years and who the U.S. is trying to destroy now and who NATO said at their recent summit they're openly trying to destroy. So, you know, while claiming to be a Marxist, Zizek puts himself on the same side as NATO. Second aspect are these geopolitical interventions, war, and so on and so on. To tell, without military American intervention in Iraq, to cut a long story short, there wouldn't have been ISIS, there wouldn't have been an, uh, uh, what goes on now in, in Syria. Without the stupid Western intervention in Libya, there wouldn't have been what is going on now in Libya, and so on and so on. It's just, it's, this is for me elementary, especially, I want to emphasize the tragedy of Iraq. It's almost a comical tragedy. And here's what I always say. Everybody's an anti-imperialist in hindsight. Everybody's an anti-imperialist 20, 10 years after the war happened, and a bunch of leaked documents prove that the U.S. was involved and they were doing it, you know, for capital expansion. They were doing it at, be, at the behest of corporations, right? But not everybody is an anti-imperialist when the war drums are beating. When the U.S. is trying to manufacture consent and hatred against uh, an enemy state like they're trying to do right now with China, right? Because when there's a lot of lies and propaganda and when it's not popular and when it's not fun or when it yeah, it doesn't make you popular within the capitalist academy that Zizek lives in, um, or works in, you know, it's it's much harder to go against the the popular narratives about China that are untrue, you know, and are being cooked up in order to foment regime change or manufacture consent for regime change and war. So he can go, you know, uh, yeah, neocolonialism in the West is bad, but let's focus on China. China's real bad. China's the new neocolonial power in the world. Um, but we can still acknowledge that Iraq and that Libya were bad, you know, and to me, this is elementary, like, oh, you're so smart, Zizek. You think the NATO intervention in Libya that brought slavery back to the country and has kept them in a state of civil war where they basically have no central government at all ever since was bad? That's, oh, you're so wise. What great analysis. But, you know, these fake Marxists, these fake leftists can talk about the interventions that happened years ago that we know were horrific and killed millions of people. And they'll look at those and say, yeah, yeah, Iraq was bad. Libya is bad. But let's turn our focus to China. We should be angry about China. Look what China is doing. Shouldn't we attack them? And the, the contemporary geopolitical issues, the, the attempts to manufacture consent for war by the U.S. ruling class and corporate media that are going on right now, these pseudo-Marxists lend their support. Um, the pseudo Marxists always lend their rhetorical support to those, you know, let's look at China. Let's look at the neo-colonial project China is doing and, and ignore what the West is doing. I mean, yeah, yeah. Libya and, and Iraq were bad, but let's send the troops to China. That'll be better. Everyone's an anti-imperialist in hindsight. Tragedy. The ultimate stupidity, namely... Americans intervened, and incidentally, this is one of the very dark chapters of American feminism. Nancy Fraser wrote a good book on it. How many American feminists supported American intervention, it will bring freedom from Muslim oppression to women of Iraq, where unfortunately it's the exact opposite. Because whatever Saddam was, and he was a monster, his regime up to the end, when he started to flirt with Islam to get support, his regime was basically Arab nationalist secular one. And at least his record with women was way above the usual Arab standards. Women got many public posts, they were educated, and so on and so on. This is now 
the situation of women as the result of American intervention is much worse. There is another paradox. Under Saddam, there were around 2 million of Christians in Iraq. Who, if they didn't mess with politics, of course. They, no problem, they lived there. Now, the result of American occupation, because the public order police disintegrated and Islamic Muslim militias took over, and uh, uh, mass, uh, Christians began to feel the pressure, already around, I think, three quarters of Christians left the country. So that's the result. Much worse situation for women, and it's nice irony, a Western Christian country uh, invades Iraq, and the result is Christians are out. <laughs> you know, what Islam was not able to do in thousands of years and so on. So what I'm saying is that... I mean, and that's happened in almost every Arab country. You could go down the list um, and and show how the U.S. has backed far-right extremist groups every step of the way. Like he says, the Christians were kicked out at one point. There was a CIA document called Hope Lay in the Muslim Revival. This is laid out in Vijay Prashad's Washington Bullets, um, where the U.S. noticed that there were a lot of um, – a lot of Muslim political movements um, in the Arab world or, or in West Asia in general um, who were moving to the left, who wanted to nationalize various industries like he's talking about there with, with Iraq. Um, so what the U.S. did was they looked at any Muslim movements that were counter to that, any right-wing, pro-Western, uh, pro-U.S., neoliberal Muslim movements, and they funneled arms and guns into them. Um, by example, Osama bin Laden's Mujahideen in Afghanistan who who murdered um, literacy workers and people who were attempting to develop infrastructure in the country. And of course, you know, this makes the culture more right wing and more hateful to women because the right wing um, political movement to hate women who <clears throat> will allow Western corporations to, to do whatever they want with the country are the ones who are being funneled arms and weapons by the U.S., these far right groups. Um, but still he just says, you know, uh, most Arab countries don't, don't treat women like we do in the West. Um, so I, I don't totally agree with this critique, but he does make a good point that a lot of feminists support these, these interventions, um, you know, that are ultimately really, really hurt the standing of women do things like allow ISIS to take power in Iraq or, or create ISIS is what the Iraq war did. Um, a, a political, a powerful political movement that's obviously extremely um, uh, against the the rights and privileges of women. You know, so you have the paradox of Western feminists trying to or supporting imperialism because I think it's going to bring you know more women's rights to a country, and then it, it does the exact opposite. Um. <clears throat> But like I said, it's the same thing. Everybody can look back, you know, and, and um, analyze these things in hindsight. Um, but I, I don't know. I kind of agree with this point there. The only thing I disagree with is that he said, uh, you know, all Arab countries are pretty much backwards. But Saddam was good compared to them. And it's like, yeah, the, um, the Iraq war, the overthrow of Saddam, who was originally put in power um, with the help of the CIA, was not the only U.S. intervention that put um, extremist right-wing political groups in power in the Arab world. You know, you can look at one, and or you can look at least at at least one regime change effort by the U.S. in in every country that affected their politics and helped bolster the right wing. Um, and more so than that, you have these programs that were carried out, like the the CIA program. Um, that they called the Muslim revival where they were just looking for right-wing extremist Muslim groups and trying to support them all across West Asia. Um, so this has had a much bigger effect, I guess, than, than Zizek is um, making it out. All this background has to be taken into account, but, 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 there is a but. Don't, on the other hand, don't patronize the Arabs in the sense of, you know, it's very popular in Europe, this, how do I call it, uh, masochist leftist attitude. Whenever something bad happens in the third world, it must be the consequence of neocolonialism. We are to be blamed and so on and so on. No, this is stupid. I'm sorry to tell you. Arabs are not just passive victims. They have certain projects. They are, I speak like Sartre here. We are never just passive participants in a situation. Yeah, but if a much more wealthy country 
like the U.S. with a huge military, with a military that we put $700 billion into every year and a much more industrialized or a much stronger productive base, which serves the military industrial complex, overthrows an Arab country's government and puts in power one that's not democratically supported, then yes, you have to talk about the way that that affects the country and affects their culture and affects their politics and affects their belief system. And he says, you know, everybody wants to break things down to neocolonialism. Well, imperialism is the stage of capitalism we live in, right? Every single country is affected by the IMF, the World Bank, and the 16,000 um, tentacle banks that stem off of them that encompass the entire world, right? These are multinational corporations who are um, using the U.S. government and the U.S. military as an imperial tool um, to overthrow countries that they don't like. They're multinationals, meaning the corporations that exist today and are most dominant in the world system, the world economy, are multinationals. They stretch everywhere, right? So we have to look at the global system of capitalism and the global system of imperialism when we analyze any country, you know, just because that is the stage that capitalism is in and capitalism is the, the economic system that we live under. Right. So imperialism is going to be a huge factor in analyzing any country's politics. Right. And here you have Zizek. Like, ah, we're looking too much, you know, at imperialism. We're looking too much at colonialism, which is, you know, nothing a true Marxist would say, because everyone would understand any true Marxist should understand that imperialism is not an action. Right. It's not the Iraq war. It's not the NATO intervention in Libya. It's the global system. It's the global system which extracts wealth from the global south and overthrows any government that tries to prevent the U.S. from extracting their wealth and exploiting the wealth of a country, right? There's um, these, these global tendrils of finance capital and these NGOs that reach into every country and meddle in their politics, right, and funnel money into the U.S. and the finance capitalist preferred groups, right? The imperialism isn't just the Iraq war. It's not just them taking out Saddam Hussein or taking out Gaddafi. It is a global system that looks to maintain itself and in order to maintain itself needs to um, exploit um, and dominate foreign countries um, via or at least uh, the system as it exists today where the Western um, finance capitalists are dominant. And, and any Marxist should understand this, but Zizek, like I said, he isn't a Marxist. He uses Marxist rhetoric, but then waters it down with anti-Marxist points. Like, why are we so worried about imperialism in, in West Asia? You know, why don't we look at how these Arabs are acting? You know, they're pretty backwards, aren't they? Ultimately lending his rhetoric to support for imperialism and, and U.S. interventionism in, in the Arab world. Um which is the the overall function that his rhetoric serves and, and the overall position he takes within the global theory industry. Yeah, I'm the Marxist, right? Yeah, I'm the communist. I just support um, U.S. regime change efforts and right-wing reactionaries in every country overthrowing their government, except for Iraq and Libya. We react even when we are in a worse situation through certain, let's call it, existential project. So uh, we... So I think that this type of self-culpability, we are responsible for everything and so on and so on, it's not such a simple. For example, what Saudi Arabia, let's forget about ISIS. I don't worry about so-called terror. But for example, what Saudi Arabia is doing and some other countries, it's clearly not that they are victims. It's a well-defined religious political project. A project that couldn't be carried out without the support of the U.S. Well, maybe now Saudi Arabia is moving towards trading with China, um, which might destroy the U.S. petrodollar. But Saudi Arabia is a huge piece of that global imperialist capitalist system I was talking about because that's the, the main source of oil in the world. They're deeply allied with the U.S. and they only trade oil um, in the U.S. dollar, which makes the U.S. dollar the most dominant currency. Um, and, and now that's starting to change as China is countering U.S. global imperialism, which Zizek just said he's against. Um, but that's a huge part of the global imperialist system. That's a huge part of neocolonialism, which Zizek just said we shouldn't spend so much time analyzing. 
So like, we should just m- look and focus more on how backwards these Arab people are and how they always want to do things. or uh, They're always just going to be reactionaries and tend toward being reactionaries. Like, no, it has much more to do with the productive base or, or with economics than it has to do with, you know, any group of people um, just being inherently bad. That's a neo-colonial, that's an imperialist ideology or a way to look at things, an idealist way to look at things, not a materialist way to look at things. Um, and there are many, many, many material reasons Saudi Arabia is the way they are, and they wouldn't be able to do things like their horrific genocide on the people of Yemen without the U.S. fueling their jets and sending them bombers and sending them resources. Everybody knows this, which is why there's been so much effort to try and get Biden to stop funding, uh, yeah, funding and funneling money towards the genocide in Yemen. And Biden promised to on the campaign trail, but he can't because imperialism and capitalism are a global system and the U.S. is reliant on helping Saudi Arabia do whatever they want um, or the current government in power in Saudi Arabia helping them out um, if they want to maintain that global imperialist system. So that means funding the genocide of Yemeni children that pushed one in 25 people in the country into cholera, um, a disease where you poop diarrhea so much that you die of dehydration. Um, So that's where your tax dollars are going. And that's where your tax dollars will continue to go until there's a working class um, socialist revolution of sorts or the working class is in power of the government, the state in the U.S. um, So we can move away from capitalism. That's the only way we can move away from imperialism because the current system, though, is run by um, finance capitalists on Wall Street in London, and they are reliant on exploiting most of the world. They're reliant on having cheap labor, access to cheap labor in most of the world. They're reliant on having free trade with these areas. They're reliant on um, these countries allowing multinationals to exploit their resources, meaning they're reliant on these countries to have pro-U.S. politics or pro-U.S. governments that don't put any rules banning Western companies from exploiting them. Right. So there's no way to stop these corporations from doing this by just voting someone in um, who's a little bit nicer than, than Trump or whatever. Right? There needs to be a working class revolution that kicks capital out of power right? and starts to transition economic power into the hands of the workers. Otherwise, the current economic system will continue to perpetuate imperialist violence and economic warfare and things like that, which is what Zizek's telling us we shouldn't care so much about. And that, my friends, is why Slavoj Zizek is the, um, the jester of the capitalist class or whatever the heck Gabriel Rockhill called him. Um, the court jester, capitalism's court jester, right? Because he pretends to be a Marxist. He pretends to be an anti-imperialist. He says Iraq and NATO were bad things. You know, these interventions that killed millions of people. But ultimately, he lends his support to pro-imperialist rhetoric um, and the, the current contemporary modern plans of imperialism, just like he did when he helped overthrow the state of Yugoslavia with the liberal democratic party. You know, I've never heard of a Marxist who's part of the Liberal Democratic Party that helped overthrow a socialist government. Um, but I guess that count, you know, you can you can do that and still be a Marxist nowadays. Um, <laughs> and he's lending his support to imperialism with the U.S.'s new Cold War against China. And he's lending support to imperialism with the U.S. proxy war against Russia by saying you need to just support Ukraine full stop. All leftists should support Ukraine full stop which amounts to, you know, supporting a U.S. imperial project in Russia using the Ukrainian people as cannon fodder, again, quoting Gabriel Rockhill 